welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Today we're talking about something pretty exciting. In the history of Eusebius and in the history of Socrates Scholasticus, we're beginning to make the transition from the period of the apostles to that first generation of church fathers. We have kind of that major first group. We have uh, Polycarp, a direct student of the Apostle John, Papias, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch. These are the first ones attributed to church history as separated from the apostles, but carrying on the faith. In a recent video about Ignatius, we see that he is the one who had the vision that for the church to survive, it was going to have to adopt some of the hierarchical structure that the Roman municipal government had with metropolitan, regional, and local. And that had come from his life experience of watching the church where he was in Syria all but die. Now today we're looking at chapter 34 of book 3 of the history of Eusebius to learn a little bit about the writings of Papias, who was allegedly a pupil of Polycarp and may have been directly involved with John the Apostle too. Let's see what it has to say. There are extant five books of Papias, which bear the title Expositions and Oracles of the Lord. Irenaeus makes mention of these, and that they're the only works written by him. In the following words, quote, These things are attested by Papias, an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp in his fourth book. For five books have been written by him. These are the words of Irenaeus. But Papias himself did the preface in this book. And it's important to note that while Irenaeus says that Papias had this connection to John, Papias says it a little bit different. He himself in the preface to the discourses by no means declares that he discourses and uh, that he was himself a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he shows by the words which he uses that he received the doctrines of the faith from those who were also his friends. He says, but I shall not hesitate also to put down for you along with my interpretations whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth. Not in those that relate strange commandments, but in those that deliver the commandments given by the Lord. And springing forth to truth itself. Well, I'll tell you, I like Papias already. If then anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders. What Andrew or what Peter said or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or by James or by John or by Matthew or by any other of the disciples of the Lord. And what things Aristian and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord, say. For I did not think what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voices. It's worthwhile observing here that the name John is twice enumerated by him. The first one he mentions in connection with Peter, James, and Matthew. And the rest of the apostles, clearly meaning the evangelist. But the other John he mentions after an interval and places him among others outside of the number of the apostles, putting Aristian before him, and he distinctly and he distinctly calls him a presbyter. This shows that the statement of those is true, who say that there were two persons in Asia that bore the same name, and that there were two tombs in Ephesus, each of which 
even to the present day, were called Johns. This is a well-known historical fact still believed today. In fact, one of the fascinating traditions of the church in the writings um, in Ephesus, which by the second century, the 100s, when uh, around the time Ignatius died, uh, was a very popular Christian center. Jesus' mother Mary had gone on to live at Ephesus with John. John had been at the foot of the, of the cross. And the exchange of Jesus saying, Mother, meet your son. Son, meet your mother. Uh, that John took that to mean he was to care for Jesus' mother. And according to church history, he did do just that. And they lived in Ephesus. It's important to notice this about there being two Johns, because we get this pretty consistently in church history. For it's probable that it was the second, if one is not willing to admit that it was the first that saw the revelation, which is ascribed to the name John. And Papias, of whom we are now speaking, confesses that he received the words of the apostles from those that followed them but says that he himself was a hearer of Aristian. Papias gives also, in his other work, accounts of the words of the Lord on the authority of Aristian, uh, who, he was, who he mentioned above. And tradition was handed down by the presbyter John, to which we refer those who are fond of learning, uh, but now we must add to the words of his which have already quoted the tradition which he gives in regard to Mark, the authority of the gospel. It is in the following words, this also the presbyter said, Mark having become the interpreter of Peter. In one of Papias's other works, he also makes mention of Mark and how Mark had become kind of a spokesperson for Peter. Uh... Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not indeed in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him. Uh, but afterward, as I said, he followed Peter, who adapted his teachings to the needs of his hearers. But with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourses so that Mark committed no error while he thus wrote some things he as he remembered them. For he was careful of one thing, not to omit any of the things which he had heard, and not to state any of them falsely. These things are related by Papias concerning Mark. But concerning Matthew, he writes as follows. So then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language, and everyone interpreted them so as he was able. And the same writer uses testimonies from the first epistle of John and from that of Peter likewise. And he relates another story from a woman who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is contained in the gospel according to the Hebrews. This thing we have thought it necessary to observe in addition to what has already been stated. So what's fascinating about this, what did we say at the beginning of this video? That we're starting to see the transition from the period of the apostles to the period of those who recorded the words of the apostles, sat at their knees, who walked up to men like John, Mark, Matthew, and said, is it true that you were there with the one they called Jesus? Is it true that he showed up after he had died, resurrected, at your home, and was hungry and thirsty and ate honeycomb? Tell me about it. And these men began to communicate with each other, build their own little circles of friends. And what Papias is saying here is, Papias did not change the words he wrote to correct them to reflect what he had heard about Jesus. No, no, no. He wrote exactly what he heard Polycarp say about John. And just like Mark wrote exactly what he heard Peter say about the Lord, right? It was their job to transmit this information as accurately as possible. 
So now we're starting to see this generation, this first generation of church fathers who were this close to the Lord as far as having met him, but did touch the apron strings of the apostles and entered the next chapter of Christian history, which we too are about to enter. Friends, God bless you. I love doing these videos with you. If you'd like to support us, please do. PayPal is an option. So is Cash App, so is Venmo. You can also go to the Teespring store, which is currently being revamped. Get yourself a t-shirt or a nice True First Christianity mug. Um, you can also uh, visit Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett and get one of the books we've written from the Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity series. The Truth About the Reformation and Counter-Reformation had a slight holdup, but it is almost done. We're also in the process of building evangelistnickgarrett.com. Uh, any contributions or ties that we get at this time are going to go toward building that website. Um, also, you can become a channel member by joining. You can become either a deacon, uh, an archbishop, or a crusader for a small amount of money. And each of those levels gets perks, special things that only those individuals get. But for those of you that just watched the videos and want to continue watching them for free, nothing changes. You can continue watching them for free. Speaking of deacons, we have two so far. I would love to get to the number seven because we know from church history, and this is how I don't understand how people can't believe, the history books make it clear that there were seven deacons almost immediately after the death of Christ. Stephen was one of them. He got stoned to death. You know who another one of them was? Nicholas, who was selected prior to Pentecost, and he ended up leading a heretical sect called the Nicolaitans. Fascinating stories about the church. Specific information we know about it. Friends, God bless you, and may your work today bear fruit.